I was making a basic comparison between the state of consciousness of a baby and that of a so-called mature adult, respectively what we would call undifferentiated and differentiated. The adult consciousness being highly selective and the baby consciousness being very open and hardly selective at all, and therefore unable to distinguish what adults consider to be the important things, which have to do with the conventions and rules that the positive aspects, whether they be called good or pleasant or life-giving and so on, must prevail over the negative aspects. And I went on to show that this contrast between the two views of the world has another marked characteristic, that in the case of the baby who hasn't been trained or told about the difference between himself and all that is defined as other than himself, doesn't distinguish between voluntary behavior and involuntary occurrence. And, of course, we think this is a very fundamental defect. But if we go back, you see, to a principle that underlies the whole universe with a kind of mathematical exactitude, we see that if we reduce things to the situation of primal simplicity, and we have a primordial self and other situation, that is to say, two balls in space, there is absolutely no way of telling when they move which one of them is moving or which one is still. They must necessarily appear to move mutually. There's no point of reference except each other to determine which is moving and which is still. Now, everything that goes on in the universe is simply a complication of that principle because the same thing holds true if you multiply the number of balls. You will see that that primordial principle that all movement is mutual, still applies. And therefore, the baby's failure to distinguish between the voluntary and the involuntary, the I and the other, is in a way correct. Psychologists, psychoanalysts in particular, make a great deal of this contrast and consider that the baby's view is inferior to the adult's. And if an adult should acquire that view, in psychoanalysis, this would be called regression. The point that is missed is that the two ways of looking at things need each other to balance out, and that one needs the baby's view as a basis for the adult view, because if you don't have it, you take the adult view too seriously, get completely carried away by it. And that would be analogous to a person who, in playing poker, loses his nerve because he doesn't realize it's only a game. And so he becomes a very bad player. In exactly the same way, we in life are only playing a game. But because we didn't keep the baby view, we can't see it. So what we would call a Buddha view is one that knows both and therefore is not taken in by the adult games, although perfectly capable of playing them, but insofar as they are not regarded as finally and absolutely serious, he is not captivated by them. Now, therefore, one asks the question, that sounds very interesting, but how do I recapture the baby point of view? And I showed that that was the wrong question, because it arises entirely and exclusively out of the adult point of view. Because the adult point of view involves the fiction that I exist as an agent, independently of everything else that's going on. And so I ask, how can I do this? And the important thing is to realize that the feeling of there being this isolated I is part of the game and it has no fundamental reality, except as a convention. And so long as that isn't clear, we're confused. I reiterated the point that when we ask to whom must it become clear or to whom is it not clear, that this too was all part of the illusion of the world that the adult presents to the child. So the only way in which the child's vision can come again is in the realization that the I can't do anything about it at all and can't even do nothing about it. All possibilities of vision for what we call I myself are out. And this, and of course, is the same meaning that the Christian or the Islamic mystics would say, that the mystical experience is the gift of God and there's nothing you can do to get it. That's a clumsy way, really of saying the same thing.
Because so long as you are trying or not trying, you are aggravating the sensation of the separate ego. Now that in itself, you see, as I talk about it, presents a certain difficulty, or one thinks it's difficult. There would be a second difficulty if we were to go on and say, it isn't only the illusion of the ego, but the whole valuation system that we put on the complexity of vibrations we call awareness of life. All the various valuations that are put on this by the social game are maya, that is to say they are illusory, basically, because it's only in play, as it were, that we say this is good and this is bad, this is advantageous, this is disadvantageous. And so we would go on to say after this, but I cannot imagine anything more difficult than overcoming that hypnosis. I am so enchanted by this system that the idea of treating it as not really very serious seems to me unthinkable. Of course, you have to think that. It's like a hypnotist working on somebody and saying, you are not going to remember any of this conversation after you come to. And so he's put the suggestion into you that you forget the whole thing. So in the same way, the suggestion has been put into all of us that these rules that we have learned are sacrosanct. They don't say you will not be able to think otherwise. They say they are true. They are the truth, you see. And that is the same function as the hypnotic suggestion put into us ever since we were receptive children. So naturally, it's all part of the conspiracy which we are playing on ourselves. We can't blame our parents for this because their parents played it on them and they bought it. And don't forget that time goes backwards. You see, <laughs> you can't blame this on the past because now in the present you are creating the, value, the values of the past and you are buying them all along, you see? So there's no, no out on this. You see, in a way, psychoanalytically, one is given an out by saying, well, the parents didn't bring up their children properly. And American people are consumed with guilt about the way they, do, they bring up their children. So we must abandon completely the notion of blaming the past for any kind of situation we're in and reverse our thinking and see that the past always flows back from the present, that now is the creative point of life. And so you see, uh, it's, it's like the idea of forgiving somebody. Uh, you change the meaning of the past by doing that. The present is always changing the past. So when you get the idea in your mind that the point of view I'm talking about is very difficult indeed to acquire, that idea is one you are putting there to stop yourself seeing the other point of view. And above all, you must not take that seriously. It is simply a method of postponing seeing the point now. So you have to see it now or never, because there is only now. If you say, well, tomorrow, the next day, maybe in another dozen lifetimes, I'll be ready. That means simply and solely, I don't want to be bothered with it now. I'm even not interested in it now, so I've got an excuse for putting it off. Which is fine, that's perfectly okay. <laughs> you can put it off. There is no reason, there is no compulsion why you should come out of this illusion. But if you don't want to, you can stay there. It's okay, there's lots of time. And maybe you'll see through it when you die. At least in the moment of death, <laughs> you'll see that it was all a fake. 